Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to come today to speak to you. So we're going to switch gears. We've talked about viral hepatitis all morning. We're going to talk about something that's new, uh, near and dear to my heart, and that's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So my hope today, and, and Scott kind of gave me a little bit of pressure here, I need to finish within 30 minutes, so I may speak a little bit faster to get through all of the slides. But today what I'd like to do is just go over what is NAPL, um, we'll look at the epidemiology, we'll look at the natural history, we'll look at treatments, and really you'll find out right now the gold standard is lifestyle interventions. We'll look at recommendations when to use vitamin E and pyoglitazone, and then at the end I'll just give a summary of what promising uh, medications that we have uh, in the future for fatty liver. So what is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? So that is the presence of steatosis, which is fat, in the liver but it can only be diagnosed in the absence of ruling out other causes of fatty liver, specifically viral hepatitis, Wilson's disease, hemochromatosis. You also have to make sure that certain medications are not inducing hepatic steatosis, and that would be methyltrexate, corticosteroids, um, patients that were treated for breast cancer that were on tamoxifen. Most importantly, though, you have to rule out excessive alcohol use as a cause of steatosis in the liver. And excessive alcohol use has been defined as greater than 21 drinks for men per week and greater than 14 drinks per week for women. So what is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? It's a spectrum. Think of it as an umbrella. So you have this NAFL, and under NAFL, you have simple fat in the liver. This is benign fat called Napple. It causes no harm in the liver, but then it can you can have progression where you have non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is fat that induces injury in the liver, and it causes inflammation, and over a period of time may lead to scarring or fibrosis. So this gives you an idea globally the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So globally, we're looking at about 25% of patients that have fatty liver. But you can see here that patients that are in the Middle East, um, the highest prevalence of fatty liver uh, is 31%, compared to the lowest incidence, which is in Africa. Now look mm -hmm. in North America. So in North America, you can see that 24% of patients have NAFLD. What does that mean? So that equates to about 80 to 100 million Americans United, in the United States that have fatty liver disease. And if you look at the component that we're most concerned about, which is NASH, that's about 20 million people that have that fatty liver that causes inflammation and can lead to scarring. There is an eth ethnic um, predisposition, so we know Asian Indians, Hispanics, they have a higher uh, rate of uh, fatty liver. African Americans seem to be protected. And there's certain syndromes or something called the metabolic syndrome and risk factors that we look for in patients that have NAPL. And that's obesity, hypertension, elevated triglycerides, they can have insulin resistance, diabetes, and very, very interesting, what we're finding out is that there's a genetic component now to fatty liver and a specific gene, the PNPLA3, that is linked to um, patients that have fatty liver. Now, how do we diagnose fatty liver? Well, fatty liver can be diagnosed on imaging. So you can have an abdominal ultrasound and that can show hepatic steatosis. But you have to have a certain percent. So greater than 5% is considered to be um, fatty liver disease. NASH, however, is, is a diagnosis that can only be done on biopsy and I'll show that to you. But remember, NAFL can only be diagnosed after you've excluded other causes of liver disease, medications, and you've done a detailed history that you know that the alcohol consumption uh, is not greater than 21 drinks a week for men and 14 drinks a week for women. And we're talking about standard uh, uh, drinks. So I alluded to risk factors for um, NAFLD, obesity, type 2 diabetes, and this metabolic syndrome, and people ask me, what is metabolic syndrome? You have to have three or more of these criteria in order to um, diagnose metabolic syndrome. 
So many of the patients I see have this central obesity, so their waist circumference is large. So in men it can be 40 inches, in women it can be 34 inches. You have to have elevated triglycerides, you have to have low HDL, and remember HDL is that good cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, and as I mentioned, diabetes. So why is it important for you to know if you, your patients, have, or family members, have simple fatty liver versus NASH? Because of the natural history of, of NASH, so you can see, as I mentioned, about 80 uh, to 100 million Americans have fatty liver disease, but a subcomponent have this non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. That's about 20 million Americans. And the reason that's concerning is that if you look at the natural history, you can see that NASH in about 40 to 50% of our patients can lead to fibrosis. And you know fibrosis is scarring of the liver. And there's different stages, as you've heard earlier uh, this morning, of scarring in the liver. And you can have stage one, two, three. And remember, four is considered cirrhosis. So 15 to 20% of our patients can progress to cirrhosis. Why is that important? Once you have cirrhosis, you're at a higher risk of developing um, hepatocellular carcinoma, and you're at a higher risk of decompensated liver disease, where you might need a liver transplant. And one of the concerns with fatty liver disease is liver cancer. So in hepatitis C, you need to have cirrhosis in order to be at risk for liver cancer. Not the case with fatty liver disease. So with NASH, you can skip cirrhosis, and a small number of patients can still uh, develop liver cancer. So that's why it's important for you to know if you have simple fat in the liver versus the progressive form of fat, NASH. As I mentioned, NASH can only be diagnosed via biopsy. So you have to have tissue, you have to have uh, um, histology in order to diagnose NASH. NASH is, you can see all those big white spots. Oh, okay. Never mind. Anyways, the big white spots, that's fat in the liver. And on your left hand side, you can see the non progressive form of fatty liver. So you just see a lot of simple fat in the liver. But on the, on the left side of the slide here, you can see that you have progressive um, fat in the liver and you have injury to the liver cells, the hepatocytes. And what can happen is these cells can balloon up. And that's one of the major features of NASH is you have to have ballooning of these hepatocytes because that means that there's been injury to the liver. Now, there's somewhere in the middle where you can have borderline NASH, where you have some fat in the liver, but you don't have the feature of ballooning of the hepatocytes. And that's where you want to really try to intervene with patients, too, with lifestyle. Uh, interventions, but can these be can this be a dynamic process? Can you go from NAPL to NASH or NASH to NAPL? Yes. Mm -hmm. So what's the significance of fibrosis? Fibrosis has been determined the major feature of NASH for increased mortality. So as you can see, I mentioned ballooning of the hepatocytes. That's necessary in order to to diagnose NASH. You get inflammation in the liver. But if you have NASH with fibrosis, there's an increased mortality. And that's important to know. And this slide just shows that they looked at, at patients that had just simple fat in the liver, so only fat. And then they looked at patients that had fat with ballooning and fibrosis. And you can see here that there was a higher mortality rate on the lower bar um, in those uh, those patients that had NASH compared to those patients that just had simple um, steatosis. And this is an interesting slide too. So NAFLD itself, if you look at um, patients, they did a, case, um, a study here where they looked at 229 patients that had biopsy proven NASH um, and, or NAFLD. And they compared that to over 2,200 patients that had that were not diagnosed with fatty liver. And over time, you can see on the bottom line here that those patients that had just NAFLD, they had increased mortality. Um, however, if you looked at those patients 
and the number of deaths, if you had stage two or higher scarring, that's fibrosis, which one is the? On the right. On the right. Nope. Oh, the, are you looking for the button? Uh -huh. Yeah, the top. For the red thing? Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you. Okay, so if you look at this line here, those are patients that actually um, had stage two fibrosis or higher, and they had an increased mortality rate. So my, my take home message to you is, it's important to know um, if you have fibrosis in the liver because your prognosis, your, uh, can, our concern for mortality is much higher, and we're gonna be much more aggressive in treatment in those patients that have NASH fibrosis. Now, what is the risk of progression of fibrosis? And that's important to know because in hepatitis C, it's different than in fatty liver disease. And fortunately, what I can tell you is that the fibrosis progression in NAVO is slow. So you're looking at stages. Remember, we talked about fibrosis as being zero, no scarring, stage one, two, three, and four, four being cirrhosis. You can look at the progression of, of stages roughly about 14 years per stage. However, if you have NASH, which is that fatty liver that causes injury and, and inflammation, the stage of progression is much faster and it's seven years um, per stage. And then we have a subset of patients that we really don't know why, but about 20% that can be these rapid progressors and that can progress much quicker than we would anticipate. So what does NAFL progression look like? So you can see the normal liver, and then you'll get fatty infiltration in the liver. That may progress to steatohepatitis, which is inflammation in the liver. And over time, as I mentioned, it can develop into cirrhosis, which is the end stage of scarring in the, in the liver. So in our clinic, I work in a fatty liver clinic with Dr. Lumba. Um, who is nationally known for his work in, in fatty liver disease. When we get patients, most of the time we're going to biopsy patients. But the question is, who, who should you biopsy? And what I would say is that right now we know the gold standard for diagnosing NASH, not NAFL, but diagnosing NASH, the steatohepatitis, is a liver biopsy because you have to see those ballooned hepatocytes in order to diagnose NASH. But the, as I said, the gold standard is a liver biopsy. We're working very hard right now on developing biomarkers so that people do not have to have a liver biopsy. I can tell you most patients don't want a liver biopsy and we actually don't want to order one. But I think in the next maybe five, eight years, we're gonna have biomarkers that will be able to determine NASH and not have to have a biopsy. But what patients are at risk for NASH? Again, metabolic syndrome, that's the number one feature in those patients with diabetes, type 2 diabetes. So who do we want to treat? Well, I've mentioned to you that simple fat in the liver doesn't cause harm. However, the fat in the liver, NASH, does cause harm, and over time can develop into advanced fibrosis or cirrhosis. So certainly those are the, the patients that are of high priority for us to treat for those patients that we know have NASH and certainly those that have fibrosis. I showed you increased mortality in patients that have stage two or higher. But what about just simple fat in the liver, steatosis in the liver? Again, right now, the gold standard is lifestyle interventions with diet and exercise. But also I showed you that slide where um, patients with NAFL versus patients that don't have fatty liver, they have an increased mortality. So you really want to work with your primary care doctor. You want to do risk stratification because the number one indication uh, of death in our patients with NASH is actually cardiovascular disease. So you want to work with your primary care doctor if you just have simple fat in the liver, but you also want to look at do you have other risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So the treatment right now is weight loss exercise, looking at dietary intervention, so a hypocaloric diet, but there are no FDA medications approved right now for the treatment of NASH. 
Certainly one of the things that we want to do is optimize management of metabolic syndrome. So you want to, patients that have dyslipidemia or diabetes, you want to target them to make sure that they're on a statin if indicated, or if they have diabetes, that their A1C is less than seven. I'll talk to you a little bit about when, about vitamin E and pioglitazone. It was studied in the PIVINS trial. Um, and its indication for the treatment of NASH, although it's not FDA approved. And then I'll touch a little bit with bariatric surgery because we certainly get patients in our clinic that are what would be considered morbidly obese. So bariatric can, um, surgery can be considered in patients that have a BMI, or body mass index of 40, um, or sometimes depending uh, between a BMI of 35 to 40, if they have other comorbidities. Um, that would benefit for bariatric surgery. So what about weight loss? How important is weight loss? Well, it's extremely important. So you can see with this triangle, the bottom line, cetosis, is just fat in the liver. And if you lose just 3% of your weight, you can have improvement in the fat in the liver. If you lose 5% of your weight, you can actually have improvement with the ballooning of those liver cells, those hepatocytes. And as you increase up the pyramid and you lose more weight, you can actually have resolution of NASH. And that's what patients ask me all the time, can I reverse my NASH? And I say yes, and I can show them this. And what this does is empower the patient that they have control. So it seems you know, very simple for me to say weight loss, but I want them to know that they have the power to do weight loss and have resolution of their NASH. Um, and then in some patients, if they have greater than 10%, almost half of the patients can have some improvement or regression of their fibrosis. This is a very, very interesting study, albeit it's a small study of 30, 30 patients, but it was a randomized control study where what they did, they had biopsy-proven fatty liver NASH. Um, and what they did was they randomized these patients into a lifestyle arm versus a control arm. Now the lifestyle arm was um, patients that were meeting every week, and the lifestyle arm focused on behavior modification. They were to exercise up to 200 um, minutes a week. They were given a hypocaloric diet. So depending on their weight, if they were um, less than 200 pounds, they were given 1,000 to 1,200 calories a day. If they were greater than 200 pounds, they were given 1,200 to 1,500 calories a day. Versus the control arm. The control arm, what they did was they met every 12 weeks. They had some basic education on diet, on exercise, on healthy, healthy eating, but they didn't have the intensity in the weekly meetings like the lifestyle uh, interventions. And what you can see here is over a 12-month period, those patients that were in the lifestyle arm lost 7% of their weight versus those patients that were in the control arm did not have weight loss at all. So in summary, weight loss can improve, as I mentioned, liver histology. And really, lifestyle modifications, that's the number one thing I work on when patients come into my clinic, is the first thing I want to do is really look, on, look at lifestyle modifications. And also, I want to have them come back to see me sooner than later, because studies have shown that if you watch them more closely and you keep patients accountable, they tend to do better. Now, I mentioned metabolic syndrome, and just for your, your education, what, what metabolic syndrome is, is that you have to have three of these five criteria. Also, you want to look at reducing cardiovascular risk, and as I mentioned earlier, if a patient has uh, dyslipidemia, you, they may be eligible for a statin. You want to look at lifestyle interventions, really targeting their A1s. A1C less than seven. So you can imagine in our fatty liver clinic, we work very closely with the primary care doctor um, or providers to have a holistic view of the patient and really try to make our recommendations um, what would be beneficial for the patient, but then also do our part in educating the patient. So I mentioned um, a study that was done, um, and this was a study that was done in 2005 and two 
2007, and it was actually published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what it was, it was a study that looked at randomizing patients um, to pioglitazone or vitamin E. So they had a vitamin E arm, a pioglitazone, pioglitazone arm, and they had a um, placebo arm. And it was 247 patients who had biopsy-proven NASH without diabetes. And their primary outcome was to look for improvement in histology. So what they wanted to see was, if you receive vitamin E or, or pioglitazone compared to placebo, was there a benefit? And you can see those patients that have vitamin E, they actually have a statistically uh, improved histology compared to placebo. And those patients that had pioglitazone, although it fell short of statistical um, significance, um, they did meet their secondary outcomes, and that was actually seen here, where both vitamin E and pioglitazone actually met these secondary in, um, outcomes of improving their AST, their ALT, but specifically on histology, it improved histology. So you, it improved inflammation, steatosis, um, and ballooning, but it did not improve fibrosis. The reason they think that pioglitazone did not reach statistical significance in the primary um, outcome is because they felt that there were less patients in that arm that had ballooning. And as I mentioned to you, ballooning was one of the primary outcomes that you had, either improvement in ballooning or you had um, no advancement in ballooning. And so they felt that that's why the pioglitazone arm did not reach the significance that they wanted. However, the secondary outcomes were statistically significant. So to summarize, does vitamin E improve NASH? Yes. yes. Does it reverse NASH? Yes. Does it improve fibrosis? We have no randomized controlled trials right now to say that it does reverse scarring in the liver. And does it improve long-term outcomes? Again, no data right now to substantiate that. However, there are adverse effects of vitamin E that you need to be aware of. There's a dose-dependent manner of increased bleeding with vitamin E. Also, there's a risk of prostate cancer in older men, the risk of hemorrhagic stroke, although you may have some prevention of ischemic stroke with vitamin E. So people think vitamin E is an antioxidant, it's very good, and actually there are some caveats that you need to be concerned about before putting yourself or a patient on vitamin E. So you need to balance the risks versus the benefits. So patients that have an elevated liver enzyme, ALD and AST, with suspected NAFLD, but they don't have a biopsy, we do not put them on vitamin E. And patients with mild NAFLD with no evidence of NASH, remember the study was done on patients that have biopsy proven NASH, we do not put them on vitamin E. The study that was done did not include diabetics, so there's no efficacy data on diabetics, cirrhotics, or those patients that have had liver transplantation. So you really need to look at vitamin E and outweigh the benefits during the risks to make sure that you don't put a patient at uh, uh, collateral damage, um, especially the older men, um, hypertension, uncontrolled hypertension, a history of prostate cancer, or a history of personal stroke or prostate cancer. Now, what about pioglitazone? So I showed you vitamin E was good for NASH. What about pioglitazone? So pioglitazone did meet the histological secondary outcome. So it's good for NASH, but what's the one problem with pioglitazone? Weight gain, 10 pounds within the first six months. That's a major problem. And that's what they saw in this study. The problem is, is once you stopped after 12 months, that weight didn't, it wasn't reversible. Patients didn't lose the weight once they came off the pioglitazone. So here I have a patient who has fatty liver, has obesity, and I'm telling them not to gain weight, but I'm giving them a medication that causes weight gain. There's a problem with that. So when should you use pioglitazone? Well, in patients that have biopsy-proven NASH, that have diabetes or pre-diabetes. But be cautious with that because, again, you want to be aware of the 
um, weight gain that's associated with pyoglitazone. So what would I do if I put a patient on pyoglitazone? I'd want to put them in that intensive lifestyle interventions where we're looking at exercise and we're looking at diet and we're looking at behavior modification. So I could try to um, alleviate as much weight gain as possible. We did see with the pyoglitazone arm that the ALT and AST reduced, and so that's something that I would be monitoring. But interesting, pyoglitazone is associated with osteopenia, and so your female patients, um, or patients in general, um, that you're concerned about bone mineral density, you should be watching DEXA scans on patients that have pyoglitazone. So I mentioned to you that there are no FDA-approved medications right now for NASH. However, there are numerous clinical trials going on right now, several in phase three currently. This just gives you a summary of all of the drugs that they're looking at to come up with uh, therapies for NASH. And these drugs are either targeting inflammation or they're targeting fibrosis. But I can tell you that probably in the next three to five years, we're going to have a medication on the market uh, to treat NASH. So in conclusion, when you think about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, I want you to think of this as a spectrum of disease where you can have just simple fat in the liver that doesn't cause harm, or you can have that progressive fat that causes injury and is steatohepatitis. Remember that you can only diagnose NAPL after you've excluded other causes of, of fat in the liver, meaning um, diseases, other etiologies, medications, um, and alcohol use. We've talked about the prevalence uh, globally, so there's about a 25% prevalence globally of fatty liver, but as I showed you on that map, depends on the highest incidence being in the Middle East. In North America, it's about 24%. We talked about the natural history of fatty liver, and really the current recommendation is lifestyle interventions with diet, exercise, and, and optimizing the metabolic risk factors. So those patients that have hypertension or dyslipidemia or diabetes, really making sure that you're working with a primary care provider to make sure they're getting, uh, hitting their targets um, that they should. There are some use for vitamin E and pyoglitazone, as I discussed with you, but I, I would just say, you know, be aware of the risks and the benefits with both. And then on the horizon, we do have some drugs probably in the next three to five years that, that will be available.